right, everybody, uh, we're going to get started with our next speaker who has been to Skepticon before and we're very happy to have back because she totally remembered us and loves us so much. <laughs> everybody, welcome back to the Skepticon stage, Rebecca Watson. Of course I remembered you. How could I? I would never have forgotten that I was doing this conference until a week ago. <laughs> What a ridiculous thing to even imply, Lauren, and I'm insulted. <laughs> Hello, Skepticon. Well, as I told Lauren, you know, one of the reasons why I forgot is because uh, about a year ago, I basically just stopped giving talks because I realized I just like staying home. <laughs> so I've been saying no to everything, but I always say yes to Skepticon, and uh, so I've, I forgot. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't travel anywhere. I don't do talks. And then a week ago, Lauren emailed me and asked if it was okay to switch my spot with another speaker. And I was like, oh, well, I had been planning to go on stage Friday night, so this is going to be real rough, but okay. Uh, <laughs> and normally, of course, you know, if you've been to past Skepticons, you know that I do normally speak late at night because usually I'm coming from Europe or something and Lauren just likes to keep me on my toes to make sure I'm always speaking at a time when I would rather be asleep. So, so she's continuing that tradition today by having me on at 11 a.m., which is definitely when I would still be asleep. Uh, but I'm awake, I've had coffee, I have a Coke, and I'm just really excited to be here because I do love Skepticon and it's why I always say yes and uh, hopefully they'll keep inviting me back, because I love it here. Okay, <laughs> I have to, I'm gonna try real hard today to get that invite back. Uh, so I wanted to talk today about using social media to advance skepticism, uh, because I feel like it's relevant right now with uh, the recent election, which I don't know if you guys, if you guys knew, we, had, we just had an election this week. Uh, uh, yeah, and I just got so depressed. <laughs> Uh, writing this talk that uh, last night I was at the hotel bar with some attendees and I suggested that we come up with a new talk that might be um, more entertaining and uh, not as depressing. So to come up with the title, I asked each of them to say a word. Um, and so we built the talk title around that. So I'm gonna let you guys pick either I'm going to talk about using social media to advance skepticism, or I'm going to talk about purposeful, purposeful trout rutabaga ellipses. <laughs> so, um, by applause, uh, who would like to hear about using social media to advance skepticism? And who would like to hear purposeful, purposeful trout rutabaga ellipses? All right, well, I really misjudged that. Uh, <laughs> next year? Next year, Lauren? All right. <laughs> so instead, we're going to talk about using social media to advance skepticism. But to make it a little more palatable, I have included a lot of pictures of my cats. Uh, this is Brendan Scissorpaws, uh, dressed as a shark. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Uh, so, <laughs> so before I get started there, you know, let's sort of define our terms, what I'm talking about. When I talk about social media, I'm talking about the ways that we connect with each other. And that could be, uh, it's usually via the web, uh, but it can also mean uh, mobile devices. Not necessarily in America, but in other places, SMS is really important. But around here, yeah, it's mostly Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, forums, blogs, things like that. Um, Skepticon usually tends to be a pretty hip audience, so I probably don't have to explain what a lot of these things are. But what defines social media is that your information is coming directly from your peers as opposed to a top-down authority like newspapers. And uh, that means that there's a large amount of information to go through and process, which is great for things like breaking news. So if there is I don't know, a tragic election or <laughs> earthquake or <laughs> other disaster. Um, here's a picture of my cat wearing glasses <laughs> that I tried to make. <laughs> That's all. Uh, <laughs> 
So uh, let's talk about how to use social media to advance skepticism. It's uh, pretty detailed, but basically you should be skeptical while using social media. Here's a picture of my cats. <laughs> uh, there's a quote that I've seen passed around a lot that I really like, and I think it applies to what we see happening on social media, which is, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting its shoes on, uh, by Mark Twain. And what I, I, really, I love a few things about this uh, quote. Uh, one, it's true, and uh, you know, we, we can actually back this up with data, which I'll go into in a minute. But the thing I really love about this quote is that Mark Twain didn't say it, <laughs> but if you, if you look this up on, you know, quote, search engines or anything, uh, it's almost always attributed to Mark Twain. Um, and I got curious, I, I tried to find out uh, where it originally came from, and it probably started in uh, 18, or 1710 is the earliest that I could find. Uh, Jonathan Swift did a version of it. Uh, but there's really no evidence that Mark Twain even uttered the words. Uh, so I love a good ironic quote. And it is, even though, you know, the, the first version of it was in 1710, it's still true today, unfortunately, that lies travel more quickly than truth and get passed around a lot more and can go further. So as an example, um, Twitter deaths is a popular one. Um, if you're on Twitter, you've probably seen this happen. Uh, here's a tweet that I grabbed. Uh, Wait, what? Why is RIP Bill Nye the science guy trending? No way, man. I loved Bill Nye. He was the only good part of science class. So as you might know, Bill Nye is alive and well, working on a new TV show in LA. Um, and it, it's not just Bill Nye that this happens to. Um, I collected a few that have happened over the years that I've seen pop up on Twitter and elsewhere. Bill Nye has actually died on Twitter three times <laughs> that I've been able to find. Uh, also, Bill Cosby has died four times. Not enough, if you ask me. <laughs> um, Reese Witherspoon was uh, reported to have been stabbed in August of 2012 on Twitter. And I think I can trace the origin of this one. I think it goes back to a joke uh, that goes something like, you say to your friend, hey, did you hear that that uh, actress got stabbed, Reese, uh, Reese? And then you wait for them to say Witherspoon. And then you say, no, with a knife. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure that that's where that came from is that somebody took that joke way too seriously, but that did trend. Um, Eddie Murphy died in a Swiss snowboarding accident in 2010 on Twitter. Uh, Denzel Washington died in a Swiss snowboarding accident in 2012 on Twitter. Uh, Adam Sandler died in a Swiss snowboarding accident also in 2012 on Twitter. And you know, when I was collecting these, I noticed a pattern. I don't know if you've picked up on it. <laughs> But a lot of celebrities seem to die on Twitter in a Swiss snowboarding accident. And so I looked into it and I found a website where you can go and put in any name you want and it'll, it'll reproduce an article saying that they died in a Swiss snowboarding accident. <laughs> so if somebody wants to get that going for me, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would love to pass that around. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, these things can spread really quickly and easily, and so people on Twitter can think that Adam Sandler died in a Swiss snowboarding accident, even though there's absolutely no evidence except for an obviously fake news article. Um, and in, in the case of Twitter deaths, it's not really that big of a deal unless you are the celebrity in question or their family, at which point it's probably a little upsetting. But overall, it doesn't really screw up our society too much to have these sort of lies passed around Twitter. Uh, but of course, there are lies that pass around social media that can impact our lives. And this is an early example of uh, one of those cases. Back in 2010, there was a really tight race for a Senate seat in Massachusetts uh, between the Republican Scott Brown and the Democrat Martha Coakley. 
And Coakley was uh, predicted to win by a landslide early on. And she led in the polls throughout the race. And uh, it was only at the very last minute that Brown caught up and ended up beating her in a shocking uh, victory. And the reason why is probably because he used Twitter. Uh, and in fact, his uh, staff used Twitter, and a, the group that was most famous for the swift boating of John Kerry used Twitter. And what they did was they made a Twitter bomb. They created a bunch of Twitter bots, so fake Twitter accounts, basically, and had them tweet and retweet links to websites that were critical of Martha Coakley. And not always just critical, but sometimes actually spreading complete fabrications about Coakley. And this had the impact of not just being able to dominate hashtags related to the election, things like that, um, but also they managed to get into Google search results. And this was shown by uh, a group of researchers um, in a paper called From Ob Obscurity to Prominence in Minutes, Political Speech in Real-Time Search. And what they found was that this election was tipped in the balance of Brown in part because those tweets that were tweeted and retweeted by bots became so popular that when you searched for Martha Coakley on Google, Google would show those tweets at the top of the search results. It was something that Google had just introduced, uh, this social media uh, result page. And because of that, basically they got lies pushed to the top of Google search almost immediately. And it worked, it was very effective. This uh, study led to another group of researchers at uh, Indiana State University to create a thing called Truthy, which I think should still be up. Uh, you can go there and see charts like this. Uh, this is what it looks like when a bot is on Twitter. And the dot in the center is the account that the researchers looked at. And each blue line is a retweet between the center bot and some other user. And that's how they know that that's a bot because it's a completely closed circle of almost entire retweets, so many that you can't even tell the distinct lines in the center there. Um, that's not what a normal interaction on Twitter looks like. This is what a normal interaction on Twitter looks like, or sort of normal. This is a Twitter conversation between Lady Gaga and Dick Cheney. Um, <laughs> Uh, but you can see that uh, each one of the main dots there is surrounded by people who are retweeting them. So blue is retweet, uh, orange is replies. So nobody was replying to the bot, they were just retweeting within themselves. But in this case, you have people replying, people retweeting, and then other people retweeting and replying to them. That's a natural conversation on Twitter. So I find this really cool because this is a way to take something that seems kind of nebulous uh, and very human, the idea of interacting with someone, talking to someone, and quantifying it in a way that allows you to see how people are interacting and allows you to actually tell the difference between a robot and a human. And because of that, it gives us a lot more data and a lot more ability to see how people are talking online and what they're talking about, what they're sharing, how they're sharing it, and how information spreads. Here's a picture of Fry wearing a, uh, <laughs> a costume, uh, a Totoro costume. He hates it. I threw this in here because I'm about to talk about Donald Trump, trigger warning. <laughs> um, so I thought you could use this before I, I jump into it. So as you might guess, you know, this study on Scott Brown and Martha Coakley has real-time uh, results in what happened in our most recent election. And sure enough, uh, research has already been done and is continuing to be done and will probably be continuing to be done for years in the future on this, provided they keep their funding. Um, oh, that was depressing. That was a depressing thought that just popped in my head. Um, so what uh, some researchers have already seen is that a huge part of Trump's success 
came from a successful use of bots. Now, although I'm talking about social media, um, and I'm going to be specifically talking about the Trump campaign's use of social media, I don't want to say that this is the reason Trump won. That's for long arguments on Twitter with your friends and family. Um, it's complicated. There are a lot of reasons why Trump won. But uh, this is one piece of the puzzle. Um, Trump, much more so than Clinton, made use of bots. I, not to say that Trump himself was making use of them or even that his staff was, but his fans definitely were to a huge degree. Uh, they found that maybe about a quarter of all of Hillary Clinton's uh, pro-Hillary tweets came from bots, uh, but a third of Trump's came from bots. And twice as many total tweets uh, that were positive about Trump came from bots compared to Hillary Clinton's. Uh, so it's the same impact. It, uh, as we saw in the Coakley Brown case, where uh, suddenly it looks like the support is much stronger, which emboldens people to support Trump more openly, and also pushes results on Google and other places uh, to the top of the page, which allows Trump to control the dialogue much more than he otherwise would. Uh, and who is tweeting all of this? When it, if it's not bots, who are the people who are tweeting? That's another thing that social media has made it easier for researchers to study. It's very hard to find out who exactly is uh, shilling for Trump in the local pub, but we can see exactly who is doing it online. And uh, what researchers have found is that much more so in this election compared to previous elections, white supremacists, uh, white nationalists, and Nazis, neo-Nazis, uh, Trump dominated their language for the past several months. Um, you can compare it to previous elections uh, and previous years. Uh, look at it compared to 2012. Uh, this is the number of followers that white, white nationalists have grown from 3,542 to 25,406. So an explosive growth in white nationalism uh, online. And here's what they were uh, tweeting about. These are their top hashtags for this year and Trump dominated them. Now, uh, up top are Nazis, on the bottom are white nationalists. It's a delicate difference, uh, but the, the researchers did distinguish. Both of them, though, their top hashtag was white genocide. Uh, but for uh, both of them, Trump's hashtags, which were Trump, Trump 2016, and Make America Great Again, were all in the top 10 for these groups. Compare that to uh, the previous election, and there's no top hashtags in the top 10 for these groups that are directly related to any political candidate. And remember, in the last election, there was an actual black man running for president. <laughs> so that's pretty crazy that their interests in a candidate exploded to this degree compared to the previous election. So what's, uh, what's happening when lies spread around the internet, around social media? Uh, here's a good example of something that went down in, uh, ba back during the start of the Occupy Wall Street protests. Social media was an important tool for people to organize and figure out where to go and how to protest. And uh, in the thick of it, NBC New York tweeted, Chopper 4 just told by NYPD to move. They're closing airspace over the protests for Occupy Wall Street. Uh, so that was tweeted uh, at 5 p.m. on November 17th. Uh, just 30 minutes later, uh, NYPD responded to NBC and said, NYPD has never closed airspace and it is not our authority to do so. So there's an immediate debunking of this tweet. Um, and what's interesting is that we can see how those two statements traveled around social media. So on this chart, the green line is the original false tweet, and the blue line is the correction. So as you can see, the correction comes a little bit later, um, and the, uh, 
that's the number of tweets referencing it or retweeting it uh, per 10 minutes. So as you can see, the, the mistruth was retweeted much, much, much more. Uh, the correction, the max is 100. Uh, the original false information, over 200 tweets in 10 minutes. So there's the not Mark Twain quote in action. There's the truth putting on its shoes for half an hour and then struggling to come up, to, to catch up and not getting anywhere close. So uh, while I was, I was trying to finish my slides for this talk um, and I kept having to take breaks because it was just really depressing. And so in the end, I decided to just uh, lay it all out there in, in a few depressing bullet points. Um, so point one, uh, the more inaccurate a story, the more likely it will go viral on Facebook. Social media algorithms are designed to increase engagement. So that's on Facebook and pretty much any other social media site. They want to make a buck. They want to sell advertising. They want to get you to click a link. And how do they do that? They show you the things they think you want to see or that you have proven that you want to see, the things that you will click on. Uh, because their whole point is marketing. It's not spreading accurate information. Uh, it's not persuading you to not vote for Trump. It's merely getting you to click on a link that they think you'll like. And in addition to that, that's bad enough, so that's already starting to create an echo chamber. But in addition, users will seek out the things that they want to see. Uh, they seek out confirmation of their existing beliefs. So we can't blame it all on algorithms because even when we are shown various options and differing opinions, in general, we will click on the links that support what we think. Uh, and so that creates echo chambers and echo chambers radicalize users. When you're in an echo chamber, um, this has been shown with both followers of ISIS and also the alt-right, people are more likely to go out and take action when they have other people online uh, telling them that their beliefs are correct and giving them instructions on how to take action. Uh, that's how we see hate go from being online to actually having real-world consequences. Here's a picture of Fry in a bunny suit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be fooled, he hated this one too. <laughs> uh, things are getting a little better. Uh, Google News recently in October has started adding fact checks to their results. So you'll see a possibly bullshit link and then just under it you'll see fact check and then another link. Uh, whether or not people will click it, <laughs> we have yet to know. Uh, it obviously came a little too late, if it works at all, uh, since they only introduced it in October. But it is a step. It's, a, it's an improvement over simply showing results that might be complete fabrications. Uh, Brendan also hated the bunny costume. <laughs> uh, more good news is that uh, People uh, will change their mind because of things that they see on social media. Uh, the bad news is it's not a majority, and it's mostly liberal Democrats who change their mind. But it does happen. So on this chart, you can see, uh, this is from a, a Pew Research poll that was just conducted, and they found that 25% of liberal Democrats reported having changed their views about a political or social issue. Uh, thanks to something that they saw on social media. Um, and a lot of that was uh, convincing them to vote for Hillary Clinton or convincing them to vote for Bernie Sanders. Um, only 15% of conservative Republicans changed their views about a political or social issue thanks to something they saw on social media. But it happens, and that's good, and that's something we should remember. Uh, facts can and do get corrected. Uh, on social media, and this is from a really great study that was done in 2010 about the uh, Chilean earthquake. Chilean earthquake was a uh, huge disaster and took out a lot of 
uh, access to news reports for the people who were on the ground. And so there was a network of mostly SMS text. Uh, it was a texting social network, basically, to tell people important information. Uh, things about where they could get fresh water or what areas were off limits, you know, where they could go for safety and resources. And so there was a lot of information flying around, um, both through text and on Twitter. So some researchers decided to look at, you know, once everything was done, uh, they looked at confirmed truths that were being spread around and false rumors. And so it's very difficult to tell what's happening through text, but they were able to evaluate what was happening on Twitter. And they could see how often people tweeted each of these uh, truths or false rumors. And they could see how many people retweeted it, but also how many people responded by affirming that the facts or the rumors were true, how many people tried to debunk them, uh, and how many people simply express skepticism about them. And what they found uh, should give you a little bit of hope, um, which is that the confirmed truths were almost never denied and rarely questioned, but very often affirmed. And the false rumors uh, were much more often questioned and much more often denied. Uh, they were also often affirmed, but you can see on this chart that if I didn't label uh, which were the truths and which were the rumors, now we have another way of evaluating Twitter data and being able to tell uh, truth from fiction. And that's thanks to people interacting on Twitter to help one, one another out by either uh, confirming or denying certain, certain things. And that's what even happened when Bill Nye the Science Guy was trending. I showed you this tweet earlier, and if you click on the tweet, you can see responses to it. And every response is, uh, don't freak out, it's just another Twitter death, he's still alive. Uh, except for Carly at the bottom here, who just wanted to let him know that he's very attractive. Uh, <laughs> he is, he's a good looking guy. <laughs> Uh, so here's another example of a good Twitter debunking. This was uh, during uh, the hurricane in New York. Um, again, a lot of uh, important information was being passed around social media. And a lot of it was coming from people on the ground who were tweeting what was happening in their neighborhoods, what was flooded, where the electricity was out, things like that. Uh, which was very helpful because a lot of people didn't have access, like their TVs weren't working or, you know, they, they didn't have any other access to information. So one of the uh, most popular Twitter accounts at that time was this guy, comfortably, comfortably smug, who said he was a New Yorker and was just regularly tweeting information as he came across it, like this, saying that Con Edison has begun shutting down all power in Manhattan. The trouble was that he was a troll. Everything he was tweeting sounded really sensible. Who would make that up? Um, well, I'll tell you who would make it up. Uh, this guy, Shashank Tripathi, uh, who was a big-time Republican Party donor, actually, and uh, like a very, you know, you, when you think of a troll, you think of a 12-year-old in his mother's basement, um, not a guy in a nice business suit. Like, he's an actual rich person who is going to, you know, fundraising dinners and, uh, and in his spare time is screwing with people on Twitter. Um, but what was great was that this happened overnight. This guy had started tweeting all of this false information. People immediately started responding like, hey, that's not right. You're making that up. And Twitter went after him, and they figured out exactly who he was, broadcast his name everywhere, got him banned from Twitter, and maybe ruined his life. I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> Screw him. So, so there's a lot of uh, bullshit that flies around. Um, how can you figure out what is and is not real? Um, these are all photos that were passed around during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, none of them are real. <laughs> the big one is from that terrible Day After Tomorrow, I think, <laughs> movie. Um, so 
uh, actually, I think, I think the top right one, I think I did throw a real one in there just to screw you up, but I, I was very tired when I did it, so I don't know, you figure it out. Uh, <laughs> But that's just, that's just it. When you see all of these photos that are coming in uh, during an emergency, how do you separate truth from fiction? There are a number of good ways to do it. Uh, this is a really fun website. Is Twitter wrong? Uh, Tumblr. And uh, the guy just takes photos and things that he sees on Twitter and debunks them, basically. And uh, I really love this example. Uh, he grabbed this one from a Twitter account called Mind Blowing Facts that claimed to show a picture of India from space during Diwali. And uh, <laughs> he has this great quote. As a general rule, if you see a Twitter account that's called something like mind-blowing facts, it's probably fairly safe to mentally substitute the words deluge of bollocks in place of the name. <laughs> this is a good tip, I think. Uh, so there are resources out there like that, people who are just regularly checking in on what's trending on Twitter and very helpfully debunking it. Um, in China, they tried an interesting thing. Um, this is Weibo, which is the Chinese um, version of Twitter and Facebook. It's extraordinarily popular. They introduced a ranking system for users that gave each user a rating based on how uh, factual they were. And uh, if they trolled, if they were found to be spreading misinformation, your rating would actually go down. Um, so if anybody's watched the most recent season of Black Mirror, uh, <laughs> obviously this can uh, issue in its own problems, uh, especially coming from China where there are you know, particular problems of human rights and censorship. But it's an interesting idea that I would love to see other social networks introduce, is this idea of being able to tell at a glance if somebody is generally trustworthy or not. And with Weibo, you, you would get extra points for uh, attaching your real name and identity to your, uh, to your Weibo account. That's one way to feel if a person is a little more trustworthy than otherwise. Obviously, not everyone can do it for a variety of reasons, but it is one way to tell if somebody is at least willing to put their own name behind what they're saying. Uh, so here are some uh, quick things that you should think when you're fact-checking on social media. One is, is it too good to be true? As skeptics, we should all be uh, constantly on guard for something that we really want to hear. If somebody is telling you exactly what you want to hear, um, it should send off red flags and you should be on alert. Um, you should see if the person who's spreading this has a real name or if they have a history. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a real name attached to an account because on the internet, a pseudonym can become as good as your real name. If a person's account goes back years and uh, you know, they are tweeting a variety of things, then it's much more likely that they're going to be standing behind what they say compared to your average egg. Uh, can you contact them to verify? This is something that uh, mainstream news sources are supposed to do, uh, but don't often. Um, but the regular person can as well. Sometimes it's not too difficult to find an email or something for someone who's on Twitter claiming to be in Manhattan and tweeting things about uh, what's happening. Can you find an email for them and ping them and just try to feel them out a bit? That's often a good way to figure out if somebody is bullshitting or not. They just won't respond, generally. Uh, with photos, uh, you should uh, look at landmarks, look at uh, the um, XREF, uh, the, uh, sorry, the um, uh, XF data, sorry. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can uh, verify whether a photo is real or not. Um, you can look at satellite imagery on Google Earth to see, well, could that photo have been taken from that landmark? Uh, would that building have been in the background? Um, you can also look at uh, tin eye and reverse image search to see if things have appeared before, like in the case of the Statue of Liberty being overwhelmed by waves. Uh, you can see where that first popped up, which in this case was long before Hurricane Sandy. Here's a picture of Fry. Uh, <laughs> but in this case, I'm actually using it because uh, with images, generally you can grab the, uh, the EXIF data, and you can see that I took this with an Apple iPad 2, 
you can see that I didn't use flash. Uh, you can get a lot of data from photos, which should also scare you, by the way. <laughs> and it's something to think about when you're uploading photos online. Is your location data in there? Um, find out what you're sharing when you're putting things on the internet. Uh, but that said, when you're trying to figure out if a photo is real or not, this is one way that you might be able to uh, dig a little deeper. You can also do a fun thing called uh, image error analysis, which is not always uh, the, the most trustworthy way to figure out if an image has been edited. This is basically the equivalent of, I can tell this is photoshopped because the pixels, but it is kind of a fun thing to do. You can find these tools online. When you run it through, it'll show you the pixels that have been edited most often, basically, because every time you save an image, you lose a little data, and if you change an image, the, you lose a little data. So this shows you data that has been lost. So in this case, this is just a photo I took. Um, you can see that it's, it's pretty much, you can, you can see the outlines there, but there's nothing that's really jumping out. Compare that to this image of a little toad and a stack of coins. When you run that through, you can see that the toad and the coins really pop out against the background. Uh, and that's because this is the original image. So you can see that the body has been changed slightly, the eyes have, the eye color has been changed, and the entire stack of coins was edit, edited in. Um, and actually, that's not even the original image. If you see, that's actually what it was originally. So, <laughs> oh, hypnotoad. Uh, here's another example, a Victoria's Secret model. Um, this made the rounds a few years ago because um, you could tell it had been edited because in her right hand is the handle of a handbag that is no longer there. Um, so if you run this through image error analysis, you can see that everything has been changed. So uh, they did a little work on her eyes and her smile and they cleaned up her hair and the entire dress is colored in because if you go on their website, you can change the color of the dress to show you uh, what it would look like in different colors. That's all just done digitally, so that's why the dress looks like that. Uh, so there's another fun uh, thing that happened a couple years ago where uh, people were starting to upload videos to YouTube claiming that they were hearing strange sounds that sounded, uh, in a way, apocalyptic, really creepy. And this became uh, a, a trend. Uh, it was a, a viral thing where people from all around the world were hearing really similar sounds. Um, so hopefully I can play this, let's see. So you hear that weird sound? Uh, so let me see if I can play it again just to make sure you can hear it. I don't know how my own phone works. Don't mind me. So it's, it's pretty creepy. Um, the problem is that uh, that was Chicago. That was uploaded as a strange sound heard in Chicago. Here's another one that was uploaded, strange sound from Kiev. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe if they had edited, edited out that very particular bird sound, <laughs> it would have been more convincing. But most people aren't listening to these right after, one right after the other. There, there's, you know, there were dozens, if not hundreds, of these videos being uploaded, so people generally wouldn't notice that this was happening. Uh, luckily, there is another way to tell uh, whether or not things are bullshit. Um, this is not going to always work, so I'm basically just playing this for you for fun. Um, but first, here's the video. This uh, claimed to have come from Melbourne. Can anyone else hear that noise? Listen. What the hell is that? Hey, hey, what's that? 
pretty ke creepy, right? And, and obviously a different track. We didn't hear that same bird screeching. Uh, so how can we figure out if this is really the apocalypse? <laughs> well, uh, I decided to download the audio from this and uh, run it through a particular process uh, called center pan removal. And what center pan removal does is when you have an audio file, um, generally either it will be in mono, meaning that if you're listening to it through headphones, you hear the exact same sound in your right ear as you're hearing in your left ear. Uh, or uh, there are two tracks. There's, a, there's one for your right ear and there's one for your left ear. That's stereo sound. And that's the sound you hear like, you know, if you're listening to music and you can hear the drums sound like they're over here and the guitar sounds like it's over here. So if you look at a stereo uh, audio file, you'll see two tracks and they'll look different. The waves will look different because there are different sounds happening at different times. But if you take a mono track and you put it into a stereo track, then the waves will look exactly the same. So you can do this thing, center pan, uh, center pan, pan removal, um, you can, I think you can do it in the free program Audacity. And uh, it's most often used, I think, for um, making karaoke tracks and things like that. But what it'll do is uh, it will erase anything that's mono. So anytime those waves are exactly the same on each track, it'll cancel them out. And so you're only left with the stereo track, the, the waves that are different on each track. So I ran that audio through center pan removal and here's what I got. No more, no more narration. <laughs> Where did it go? Uh, so yeah, the camera that he shot this with was uh, recorded audio in mono, but the track that he grabbed this from, which it could have been a number of different things, uh, a lot of people used um, some people used slow down violins, some people used the audio from the movie Red State, uh, which, spoiler alert, contains an apocalyptic sound in it. Um, so yeah, what, whatever he grabbed that from, it was a stereo track. So debunked, he just added that sound in, it didn't exist. Um, you also could have debunked that by um, paying attention to his terrible acting <laughs> skills. Like, you're not talking to anybody, <laughs> shut up. So why, do you, why should we use social media to advance skepticism? What's the point? Uh, because that's how it works. If you don't do it, then uh, these, the lies will continue to lap the truth. The lies are gonna spread around the world. And at the very least, we should have the truth putting its shoes on and trying to catch up. Because even though it's not perfect, we are developing more and more tools for figuring out how to better educate people and how to better fact check things that are happening online. Uh, obviously, after this election, we have a lot of work ahead of us. <laughs> and that work is gonna be more important than ever. You know, the people who are spreading very dangerous misinformation have a leg up right now. And we all need to work together to make sure that we are stepping out of our own echo chamber and confronting these, this misinformation and debunking it when we can. And I know that that's hard. And especially right now, a lot of you are recovering from the horror of the past week. Um, but if we want change to happen, then we're gonna need to confront it head on. It's gonna be shitty, but we need to do it. Um, we need to do it on social media, but also do it at Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, I know we all have those family members. <laughs> it's gonna be a it's gonna be a rough holiday, but you can do it. Uh, but yeah, going forward, um, just you know, try to try to display skepticism about what you're being told. Uh, by even the sources you agree with, but especially the sources that are now emboldened by Trump and the neo-Nazis. Uh, so that's all I've got. Here's the last photo of some cats for you, uh, and I will take questions. Thank you. At least I think I'll take questions. Do we have time for... 
Sure, okay. Yes, I will repeat it in the mic so we have it on video. Uh, yes. Where can you learn more about how to do this? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, you could check out my website at skepchick.org. Uh, <laughs> uh, S k e p c h i c k dot org. Um, you can follow people on Twitter who are doing the debunking. Um, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. Um, I know a lot of people are deleting your Facebook right now. Um, I totally get it, 100%. But if you're on Facebook, you have more opportunities. Uh, so a lot of it really will be just about finding out the facts and make sure you're presenting those facts to people who are spreading misinformation. Um, there are a lot of uh, organizations that are now doing just fact checking on Twitter. Um, there's a, help me out, um, who does the pants on fire thing on Twitter? PolitiFact does, uh, yeah, really good real-time fact checking. Although, also, I just read a <laughs> recent research that suggests that using pants on fire is actually detrimental to their cause, uh, and that the ideal method of fact checking is to just say, that's wrong, <laughs> and not to put moral judgments in it because that's only going to push people to strengthen their position or ignore you entirely. Uh, so yeah, PolitiFact is a great resource as well. Uh, yes? So I'm harkening back to the beginning of your talk where you showed the algorithms that showed the difference between a real Twitter conversation and a bot. Yeah. Great question. He's asking, um, the, earlier I, I showed uh, how algorithms can detect the difference between real humans and bots. Uh, if scientists can do it, does that mean Twitter can do it? And if Twitter can do it, will they do it? Uh, and if they're not going to do it, should we try to make them do it? Uh, it's very difficult to get Twitter to do much of anything about anything. Uh, they do try to uh, kill off bots as quickly as they can, so I do think that they're already using algorithms to detect bots. Um, the problem is that it's, it's very easy to create new Twitter accounts very quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. Especially if you have a dedicated uh, organization that's just focused on spreading misinformation and creating bots. So, I, I do think that Twitter is, in general, handling the bot problem as well as they can, although they could make it a little more difficult to create new accounts after you've already been banned. Um, I suspect that this is something that they're also working on. Uh, when it comes to Twitter uh, changing, what I and a lot of other people have been focused on getting them to do is to get the hate accounts out. Um, it's very, very difficult to get Twitter to ban people who are sending out hateful things. And I understand that they need to be careful. They don't want to be accused of censorship of any one political opinion. And now that um, abject racism and misogyny is a political opinion, uh, <laughs> it makes it very difficult. Uh, that said, you know, I regularly get uh, rape threats and death threats or photos of myself photoshopped into pornography sent to me through Twitter. And every time I will report it, but it's a coin flip, whether I get an email back saying that the account's been suspended temporarily, whether it's been suspended uh, permanently, or whether the user in question has not violated Twitter rules. And you would be disgusted by how often I get that last email back. So what Twitter really needs to do, I think, is to come up with a better method of rooting out hate from their website. Uh, and if you saw recently, um, Trump's campaign was uh, trying to get the names of poll workers released to the public, and they went to court to do it. And there was an awesome judge, and it was all live stream, so you can see the video of this online. Uh, the judge said, have you been on Twitter? Do you see what kind of hate people get? No, you can't do this. 
And it was great for two reasons. One, because she completely shut them down and didn't allow the names of the poll workers to be released. But two, because the first place her mind went to when she thought of hatred directed at marginalized people online was Twitter. And Twitter is currently trying desperately to stay afloat. And they're not going to do it as a platform for hate. So hopefully, you know, the, the pressure is building on them to actually do something about this. But the more we speak out about it, the better chance it gets. The worse their publicity is, the better our chances get. Uh, are we out of time? Yeah, sorry guys. Thank you so much. Thank you to Skepticon for having me. I hope to see you again next year.